another friend, Andres, please, can you share your, your screen? Yes. The end, right? <laughs> we end. <laughs> yeah. It's getting late. Um, okay, the, the, let's let's uh, let's start the, the second the second uh, talk of this uh, second session. This is by our friend Andres Luna, who is going to talk about new trends in post Minkowskian gravity from amplitude and quantum field theory. Thank you, Andres. Yes. Um, so let, let me. Uh, join the, uh, the other speakers in thanking the organizers for uh, putting together this remote meeting. Um, I am very much looking forward to have one of these in, in person like uh, two years ago. Um, hopefully next year on the beach, that will be good. Okay, so um, a, few, a few comments about uh, this talk. Um, the first is that as always, um, I get to speak after uh, some very good speakers. So. I can skip a good part of my introduction and then I will focus on, on the newer stuff. So um, you can see Matt's and uh, Leonardo's talks for, for better introductions. Um, it is possible that this will be a much lower brow uh, than uh, what you have seen and what you are gonna see in the, in the next talks. Um, one thing, let me apologize in advance because um, my kid, my two-year-old has been waking up and crying so uh, if you hear like uh, baby cries that's that's my girl and um, sorry and um, not much to do because it's only uh, me and her right now um last thing so uh, it's getting late here uh, it's almost midnight so i think after the talk i will uh, run um and, and try to go to bed uh, but i'm very happy to field uh, any question or comment or Anything else that you want to discuss uh, and, and uh, discuss this offline, maybe. Okay, so um, there will be three parts to this uh, to this talk. Uh, there will be a, a short motivation for uh, what I'm saying. The second part I will describe um, like the, the origins of this uh, applying um, amplitude techniques and QFT to, to JR. And, uh, in the, in the last part, I will talk about uh, new trends. And since this is um, a new edition of a yearly meeting, uh, I will uh, talk about what has happened in the last year or so. Okay, so let's start um, by the beginning. So um, why post-Minkowskian gravity? Um, in case you, uh, you haven't heard, uh, gravitational waves were detected by the uh, LIGO collaboration a few years ago. Um, so this uh, is a breakthrough in science. This opens a new window um, or an ear to the universe. So um, as, uh, as Leonardo mentioned a, a few uh, minutes ago, um, there is a, a requirement for precision uh, for these huge, huge experiments. And this kind of precision has already been obtained, um, for example, in collider physics uh, from the new methods in, um, of scattering amplitudes coming from quantum field theory. So there's a question about uh, how could we apply uh, this kind of amplitude methods to the field of gravitational waves? Um, the gravitational waves that we have detected or that the LIGO and then uh, Virgo collaboration have detected um, have come uh, from this process of uh, the, the merger of a binary of, of black holes. Um, and this has uh, three stages. Um, the first one is an in spiral uh, where they uh, inspire each other. Um, at some point they merge and this emits a burst of radiation. And there, there is something called the, the ring down. I will focus only, uh, everything that I will discuss is applicable only for this uh, in spiral phase where perturbation methods uh, are actually applicable. So um, there we go. Um, borrowing one from uh, Alessandra Bonanno's uh, talk, what we need uh, are more efficient ways to solve the, the two-body problem analytically. Okay, so what do I mean by the two-body problem in GR? 
we want to describe um, how a couple of bodies that are separated by a distance r and um, they move with a characteristic uh, momentum p or characteristic velocity uh, one can think of this as the um, center of mass uh, momentum so if we want to describe these two bodies um, what do we do so we open uh, our uh, bachelor textbook or we hop on the time machine and we ask uh, Isaac Newton and he will tell us that uh, the interaction between them uh, it has a piece um, that is proportional to the uh, the mass and inversely proportional to the to the distance and it has this proportionality constant that uh, we call g and there's another piece uh, that is related to the um, to the kinetic energy of the of the bodies good suppose we need to do a bit better um, so we again uh, hop on our, on our time machine and we go ask uh, Einstein, um, what are the corrections that uh, GR would give to, to this? Uh, and this is what uh, Einstein Infel Hoffman uh, obtained. So this potential, uh, which is called the, the first post Newtonian correction, um, it contains now uh, a term which is order G squared. Uh, then terms that are uh, g times p squared, and um, some other terms that are uh, related to the to the kinetic energy. In this case, um, that p squared and the g, because this is a bound system, and um, the the Briel theorem applies to to it, uh, they enter at the same order in perturbation theory. So that's why it appears like. Uh, like that, G goes with P squared, and then there is like G squared and uh, GP squared and, and P to the fourth. Okay, so that guy is Newton. I'm looking only at the um, interaction part here. Uh, then uh, what we saw from, from Einstein is this uh, term that goes like G squared and B squared, and this is the first correction to the Newton uh, potential or the first post-Newtonian. In this, uh, in this way, um, you can keep doing perturbation theory, uh, just turning your crank and producing the next term um, using whatever method you want. You can use uh, directly GR uh, and ABM Hamiltonian, um, or you can apply some effective theory uh, like the non-relativistic GR um, of um, Ira Rothstein and, and Walter Goldberger. And you can go, um, all the way to four post Newtonian or fifth post Newtonian, uh, even even higher. Anyway, um, this is this has been a prolific industry. It has produced uh, many great results, but this is not what we want to talk about. What we want to talk about is another uh, kind of perturbation theory, which goes by, by the name of post Minkowski. So instead of considering a bound system, we consider a scattering system. Um, in this case, we will expand in orders of g, uh, which is the coupling constant, which is the same expansion that one gets in uh, perturbation theory in quantum fields. So um, you, you can uh, start to see why we, we like that. Um, and we consider all orders in, in velocity. Uh, there is no constraint to that. Uh, sometimes it says that it's uh, recent. Uh, but mostly it's because we never expanded in, in, in that. Okay, this is not new. Uh, this post Minkowskian approximation uh, has seen uh, contributions from many, many people, um, particularly the result from 2 p.m. Uh, was obtained in its best form by uh, Westphal in a paper in 85. Uh, but since then it, it got stopped. Um, Going to 3 p.m. it was a, a very difficult task. Okay, why do we care about, about that? Um, uh, Thibaut Amour, uh, who is uh, maybe the most important uh, name uh, in this um, solving the two-body problem analytically or and applying um, perturbation, perturbation theory, 
Um, and he has developed this, um, this technology called the, the EOB, the Effective One Body Formalism. Um, in 2016, uh, he extended his technology of the EOB uh, to the first post Minkowski order. Um, and uh, in doing so, he basically is doing uh, perturbation theory. So he gets a diagram like this. I say this diagram uh, displaying the physical ingredients of both the classical and the quantum two body scattering. Of course, um, whoever has had his uh, QFT course would say, oh, that's a Feynman diagram. Um, although uh, Damur would have some uh, hard time admitting that these are really uh, Feynman diagrams and, and nothing else. But okay, one year later, um, he extends the results to the second post Minkowski, uh, which uh, reproduces the results uh, from Westphal uh, from 85. Um, I don't have the, the picture here, but that would be like a one loop diagram. Okay. It was Damur who invited us. In that 2017 paper, um, he says, uh, <clears throat> He indicates a way to connect uh, the classical results to the quantum uh, scattering amplitudes. And he calls the amplitudists to use their novel techniques to compute the two loop scattering amplitude of scalar masses, um, from which you could deduce the, the 3 p.m. UOB Hamiltonian. Now, um, whoever who has been doing QFT for some time knows that um, going from one loop to two loops is a highly non trivial. Uh, leap there. So um, what he was asking was pretty much uh, non-trivial. Okay. So why post-Minkowskian gravity? Um, it's an alternative way to doing perturbation theory. Um, it is important to the GR people and we were invited. Okay, this brings me to the second part, uh, which is applying amplitudes and QFT to, to GR. Okay, first thing, um, the idea is not new, not at all. Uh, more than 50 years ago, uh, Iwasaki uh, had this, it's a beautiful paper uh, where he gets a fourth order potential. This is fourth order in kappa. Uh, so it's like um, order G square, uh, which basically goes towards uh, the, the first post Newtonian uh, correction. Okay, so Iwasaki 50 years ago already knew that he could use um, an amplitude and Feynman diagrams to obtain classical results. Moreover, um, one question that I uh, get often is, um, so you're computing three amplitudes, right? Because they are classical. Well, no, <laughs> you also need loops. Um, what, what we learned in, uh, in grad school about uh, loop amplitudes being quantum, it's not, uh, it's not right. So when you start having a massive degrees of freedom that propagates, uh, then loops start contributing also uh, to the classical to the classical result. But Iwasaki knew this already. So um, yeah, 50 years ago, he said, uh, we want to point out that there is the erroneous belief that only three diagrams contribute to the classical process. That's not, that's not true. Um, you can see that a closed loop will, will also contribute classically. Okay. So this was not new. Iwasaki knew to compute um, a one loop amplitude and that, that would give you a GC squared uh, potential or Hamiltonian long time ago. But that kind of went nowhere. Um, and that is because computing amplitudes beyond one loop, even one loop was difficult. Beyond one loop was impossible uh, at that point because you would have some Feynman diagrams uh, and gravity Feynman diagrams are, uh, the Feynman rules are, uh, are ugly and are long, so not very manageable. What has happened? Um, as described by uh, my fellow amplitudists, um, the collider physics program uh, said, uh, say not to Feynman. 
no Feynman, no Feynman rules, no Feynman diagrams. Instead, be more efficient, uh, be more eco-friendly, recycle what you have, um, use little trees to build, uh, to build bigger trees, uh, use trees to build loops, um, be smart, be efficient. Okay, so um, there has been a revolution uh, in how we compute amplitudes, uh, which, have made, which has made uh, some computations that looked impossible before possible. So there was an invitation by Damur to go compute a two-loop scattering amplitudes. As I said, this came after uh, the, the 2017 uh, paper. In, well, in the 2017 paper. Then in 2018, uh, there were some developments, a few important papers um, from uh, Bjorn Bohr, Damgar, uh, Festuche, Planse, and Manho. Um, they already talked about establishing a program uh, for turning uh, scattering amplitudes into gravitational. Um, uh, gravitational observables. Um, they use, for example, uh, some iconal like uh, formalism to obtain the 2PM and reproduce the, the Westphal results. Um, later, uh, Chong Rothstein and Solon, uh, they use this uh, non relativistic EFT, which uh, Leonardo described um, a few minutes ago. And they also got the 2PM. Um, using this uh, this way of translating amplitudes into observables, and um, later in the year, uh, Kosower, maybe and O'Connell, they introduce what uh, is known as as the KMOC formalism to go directly uh, from amplitudes to observables. They have no gravity in in their paper, uh, but they set up a formalism that has been successfully uh, applied to this. Um, even to, to higher loops and including radiation and, um, and many very good results. But Damur asked for 3 p.m. and they had only been doing uh, 2 p.m. That's a speed burn uh, for those of you who might not uh, know him. Um, SB took that, uh, that abstract personal and he said, oh, Okay, you want 3 p.m. We are going to give you uh, the, the 3 p.m. Um, this was in 2019, um, in January, because already in December they had the uh, December 2018 they had the, the results. Um, so what they did first, they used the amplitude technology to get um, the two loop amplitude, or at least the relevant parts for the problem. Um, what is involved here? Uh, there is unitarity to get an integrant. Um, there is uh, the, the beautiful spinor helicity to, to be able to, um, to manage this, these expressions. Um, things that are not shown here, uh, there is the, the method of region, uh, the, the method of regions, uh, which allows to consider only a subset uh, of, the, of the cuts that would enter the, the amplitude. <laughs> And they used the EFT uh, of uh, Chong Rothstein Solon. Uh, actually, Cliff, uh, Cliff Chong and, and Michael Solon uh, were authors in this, in this paper. So, um, using that EFT, they extracted a, a potential, uh, a Hamiltonian. Good. Um, which was a very important. Um, it was a very important paper because. Uh, it was already being giving a result that is uh, in some way, well, it, it is a state of the art in the post Minkowskian. It comes uh, not from uh, GR, but directly from, from amplitudes. Um, and it was, uh, I would say, after that, that um, the GR people really started uh, taking seriously the, um, the, the program of applying amplitudes. Uh, it has become a very active area of research, and now it is not only uh, describing those kind of uh, the conservative dynamics um, in the 2D problem, 
uh, but you can also use it to, to describe a radiation um, spin, uh, as Leonardo said, which is when uh, in amplitudes you allow the, um, the the states that you are scattering to, to have uh, to have spin, uh, and that reduces into uh, uh, that translates into um, the spin effects. So when you have intrinsic, intrinsic angular momentum in the bodies that are uh, that are scattering. You can also uh, describe finite size effects. So um, if you don't have black holes, but uh, I don't know, neutron stars, uh, those are parameterized by some um, by some Wilson coefficients that um, that allow to describe uh, tidal tidal effects. Um, then there are also more ways to to translate uh, amplitudes into into observables. Um, there is um, the, the iconal, the KMOC, the um, the EFTs, um, the the B two B, etc. Okay, and there are also uh, efforts to be able to more smartly uh, compute the the amplitudes that we need, including uh, the application of the of the double copy. Um, here is a, a now non comprehensive. It was comprehensive a few months ago, but people keep writing papers. So um, a long list of people that uh, are interested in this, in this program. Good. Which brings me to the, the third part of the talk. Um, so new trends, what is new? Okay, so what, what has happened um, in the last, the last year or so? Uh, I would go now through a, a long list of uh, of papers that has been published in, that have been published in the last uh, 14, 15 months. Um, so uh, before uh, I say that uh, one very important problem was this uh, doing 3 p.m. And after they produced 3 p.m., um, they said, oh, but um, 3 p.m. only gives me like the second post-Newtonian that we knew uh, in the 70s. So we need more loops. They want seven loops, <laughs> but maybe not. Uh, maybe we are not going to, to seven yet. But um, so the next thing was uh, going for three loops, um, and the three results uh, at three loops uh, they came in in January of uh, last year. Again, the group uh, of uh, Bern, um, Para Martinez. Uh, Julio Para Martinez, uh, Radu Royban, um, Michael Roof, uh, Shashen Shen, and I'm missing uh, Mao Seng there. Don't know what happened. So they were the first to, to give a 4 p.m. result, a three loop result. Um, it is full of subtleties. Um, there are many things that start appearing uh, there, in particular, something called tails, uh, which are um, are effects because of the non-linearity of, of gravity, uh, but that comes back and bites you and at three loops it gets, it gets messy. In parallel, um, <clears throat> there was a, there, yeah, um, there was an important story uh, even at two loops because um, the conservative result, it doesn't tell you the full story. And there was some indication of that here. This guy, uh, this arc cinch, in the ultra relativistic uh, limit, this goes like a log, uh, like a logarithm of the mass. Um, but there's an um, there's an old result that tells you that there cannot be a mass uh, logarithm divergences in, in gravity. So that was off. Um, and there was a long debate about uh, whether it was right or it was wrong. The answer is that um, if you only do conservative, you don't have the full story. So there is that log M. When you start including also the radiation, um, the radiation also carries the same logarithm and they cancel and everything is happy. But because of the way that this was done, um, it was never going to. Um, contain that, that other piece. So getting the radiation reaction uh, became very, uh, very important. 
and some groups, in particular um, those led by uh, Veneziano and, and Di Vecchia, and the collaboration of uh, Herman, Para Martinez, Ruf, and Seng. So they got that uh, 3PM, including radiation. Um, these guys use the KMOC. Uh, these guys use um, an icona like uh, formalism. Um, a bit later in the year, uh, the group of um, the Rumbor, Damgar, Plante, and, and Bajo, um, they did some catch up. And finally, in, in, 20, uh, in May 21, they got to the, to the 3 p.m also soft swells, including the, the radiation. Um, then in the summer, uh, the group led by Porto, they got uh, also 4 p.m. from an alternative formulation, which is called the Post-Minkowskian Effective Field Theory. Um, then the, the people from Queen Mary, uh, Brand Hover and, and Travellini, uh, Gang Chen and, and Kong Kauen, they got 3 p.m. with radiation from uh, something that looks like, like a double copy. Um, there are other interesting results uh, that link the radial action with the amplitude. The radial action is a scalar quantity uh, that then you can go differentiate and it will give you all the information you, you need. So um, this is another example of what I was saying of directly linking the amplitude to something that will be uh, or will produce uh, observables in, in gravity. Finally, towards the end of the year, um, the group led by by Swiburn, and they gave that uh, those tails in, in 4 p.m. Um, and Porto and, and friends, um, they also gave results for the 4 p.m. Uh, when they consider uh, large eccentricity limits. But that's the state of the art now. Uh, there are results in 4 p.m. Uh, coming both from amplitudes or, for, or from the post-Minkowski and effective field theory. At 3 p.m., people have done radiation reactions that does not exist yet uh, in the uh, 4 p.m. Good. How much time do I have? Well, if uh, we consider that you have arrived five minutes, well, because of in 15 minutes, something like that, it's okay for you? Uh, just what's the number? 15. 15. Good. Yes. I don't need so much. <laughs> okay. Um, then radiation. There are two uh, meanings uh, of radiation in this context. The first one is um, what you will actually be radiating. Um, the second one is the radiation reaction. So um, because you are radiating something, there is the recoil, which is what I was uh, saying about radiation before. But if we look directly on the, at the Bremsstrahlung, stradlung at the, which relates to the waveform that uh, one observes in, a, um, in an experiment, um, that, uh, as I said, had a boom in, in 2021. Um, and it was first, uh, this Herman Para Martino Ruf and Seng uh, that applied um, like a KMOC to, um, to the problem to get that uh, that Bremsstrahlung. Uh, but in parallel, um, the, the Jans, uh, Jan Plevka and Jan Steinhoff with Gustav Mogul and Gustav Jakobsen, um, they obtained uh, similar results from their so-called Warline QFT. This is a beautiful picture of their Warline QFT, um, which has become one of the uh, one of the important methods recently. And also, Mujakakos, Riva, and Bernizzi gave um, the same results from a similar formalism that they claim is very different. Um, I'm sure you can get one of them to explain what's the big difference between them. Okay, that's uh, that's too much for me. I had already mentioned uh, the uh, overlapping results of um, the groups of Veneziano and Di Vecchia and the HPRCs. But also, um, there was this uh, generalization of the KMOC uh, formalism to get the waveforms directly from the 
from the amplitudes. Um, okay. Now, another important um, uh, development in the last in the last year uh, relates to the application of these methods to gauge uh, to gauge theories and, and double copies. And this relates uh, a lot to, to Leonardo's talk. Um, so what has happened recently? Um, the people in, um, in Queen Mary, uh, Brand Hopper and Travalini with uh, Gang Chen and Kong Kauen, they developed, um, well, uh, there is a theory, an effective theory, uh, which they call um, heavy, heavy matter, I believe, effective theory. And they show that um, they can obtain amplitudes there from a double copy formalism. Um, there's also the, the result that um, Leonardo talked uh, in, a few minutes ago um, about applying um, the KMOC to, to young meals. And what we did was relate that uh, with the EFT and with uh, something that we called iconal. Uh, we were a bit cavalier to call it that. Uh, uh, fortunately, there is a recent paper by um, lots of people in uh, Edinburgh plus uh, Chris White uh, that show that that is indeed the, the iconal phase and that is indeed legal and good. Um, but more in the sense of uh, like real double copy, um, JJ Carrasco and uh, his student um, Ingrid, uh, Ingrid Holm they uh, developed a program to obtain um, GR uh, loop amplitudes in a double copy way, but actually exploiting uh, color kinematics. So it is this um, old UCLA story of uh, you're going to write an ansatz, and then you are going to check that that satisfies uh, BCJ, um, and that will give you um, a, a color kinematic dual uh, numerators and you square that and you get gravity at loop level with massive um, with massive outer uh, outer legs. So very cool results. And what was recent was that um, they implemented this this formalism to to get rid of uh, every unwanted state. Good. Um, we did some work on QED at the third post Lorentzian, which is just alpha Q. Um, ah, and also this uh, using the WQFT, which appears here again. Uh, Kanshi He and Jan Plevka show that uh, they can have a notion of uh, one of these WQFTs as a double copy of one that uh, carries gluons instead of, of gravitons. Good. Some beautiful papers that were published in the um, in the last year. There is this idea uh, about what gives you classical um, uh, classical results, uh, and one of the uh, or what what guarantees that uh, you can have classical information. And one of the key ingredients, um, Leonardo mentioned this, is, is that you have something that is a coherent state. This had already uh, been discussed in the um, in the Young Mills uh, paper, for example. I think it was um, also thoroughly exploited in this uh, waveform from amplitudes in July the, uh, of last of last year, and then uh, also for spin states uh, by Rafael Aude and, and Alex Sochirov. Um, then in, the, in December, uh, there were these two papers. Um, this by uh, Andrea Cristofoli, Ricardo Gonzo, Nathan Moynihan, Donald O'Connell, Alas de Ross, Matias Argola, and Chris White. So um, in a few, uh, in a couple of months, it will be everyone here in Edinburgh and Chris White from uh, in London. <laughs> the idea of that paper is that um, by requiring uh, that 
you can that you have uh, actually uh, zero uncertainty. So the, uh, yes, the, the signature of something that is uh, uh, quantum is that you cannot have zero uncertainty. If you impose uh, that that zero uncertainty, you can recover uh, the classicality um, from the scattering amplitudes. Um, and that relates to the coherent states and you see exponentiation. And there are so many beautiful results uh, from, from that paper. But this is just in the sense of understanding how can you really obtain classical uh, results from something that is supposed to be to be quantum. Okay, um, I don't want to take uh, much more of your time. Um, this is my favorite subject. I think I won't go through all of them, um, but spin, um, things move fast. This is not even uh, the whole year. We started here in, in June and we come all the way to uh, March and this is what has happened. Um, but basically there are many uh, approaches that are being taken. Um, the world line QFT again. I just put it because they have some uh, beautiful pictures and I wanted this to have some, some pictures that, that flash there. But, uh, and we didn't put any, any nice pictures in our papers, but okay. Um, there is that. There is also the idea of developing um, Compton amplitudes or one loop amplitudes for higher spin um, that will give you higher powers in the uh, in the effects of the of the classical spin. So Kederoli, Johansson, and Piccini uh, they computed a Compton for the black hole at spin five halves. I think this is not right. Um, some recent results recent results tell us that this might not be a black hole. It is an amplitude, but it might not be the one that corresponds to the to the black hole. Um, the the QFT people. Um, they have a beautiful result also relating to, to the black hole, which says that if in their world line QFT, uh, they put supersymmetry in their um, in their world lines, um, that supersymmetry will be related to having a black hole state. And if you want to go um, outside the, the black hole, you have to break that, that supersymmetry. Um, in November, uh, the, the group led by uh, Yutin Huang, um, they gave the, the 2 p.m. result that spin to the fourth. Um, we were about to put out spin cube. Uh, um, before that, then they scooped us. Then we had to wait a few months. And in March, we gave uh, spin to the fifth um, for arbitrary bodies, not only black holes. This was coordinated with this result by uh, Aude, Haddad, and Helset. Um, and they have a conjecture for uh, what a black hole is. They have results explicit up to spin to the seventh. Um, and also growing in the other direction, uh, there are two primary results. So two loops with spin. Um, this was there uh, by the, the Gustavs, Jacobsen and Mogul in January. And I think two days ago, uh, Francesco Alessio and, and Paolo Di Vecchia give some, um, some related um, well, overlapping result from a very, very different uh, computation. Well, um, as you see, that that, uh, that was my last slide. Um, I should have had something like a summary, uh, but uh, the summary is um, we have been making progress and we are making fast progress and things are moving fast. Um, but. Uh, this, uh, these are good times to work on this because uh, there is so much to do and uh, it, is a, it is so active and uh, we are having lots of fun. So thank you guys and I'm happy to, to answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andres. So, thank you. So we have uh, time for questions. Okay. <laughs> Um, so I'm David. It's Hi. nice to meet you. It's nice to meet you. Um, so my question is just about what you said right now, that there's so much to do. Yes. But uh, it seems like uh, 
all the observables are the dynamical observables of interest have already been computed to the well, 4 p.m. order, right? And so I'm asking, like, what's next? The 5 p.m. expansion and compute again the same observable, just that to the 5 p.m. order. Or um, I know that uh, you must include Spina as well, and yep. uh, I don't know what other stuff, but um, yeah, well, what what else can we do with this? Uh, Minkos potentials and 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 yeah, what is that much to do that you that you mentioned? Um, well, yes. So first of all, let me let me clarify that um, the only thing that has been computed to four p.m. Um, are conservative uh, results in the potential or the impulse. Um, they are they are equivalent. Okay. Then, um, what what else uh, is there to do? Uh, we need radiation um, at 4 p.m. Um, um, the thing is, there are things that are very well understood. Um, like, if you say, okay, I'm just going to compute uh, the, the conservative. Uh, that's well understood. That is a... Um, in some certain algorithmic, uh, but not really. Um, what I say is, um, yes, at 4 p.m. you start having to worry about tails, uh, which are uh, nonlinear effects of, of gravity. Um, this uh, is only, this is the, the uh, frontier, not only uh, because of the computational um, uh, complexity, but also because there are things that are not very well understood there. So there is still a lot to be to be understood. Um, issues about uh, how the um, rate radiated momentum behaves in the post Minkowskian beyond the leading order. Um, it's not only that it's not computed; it's not very well understood. Um, you have. Uh, conflicting results from different groups in the last year. Um, so there are many things that have to be cleaned up. In spin, for example, um, there are these discussions about, uh, they claim that is black hole, but is it really? Um, we say we have uh, arbitrary bodies. This guy says uh, um, we have some conjecture for what a black hole is. Uh, or how the scattering amplitude that we reproduce a black hole. Um, what's the form of that? This is just a conjecture. Um, if you really wanted uh, to compute the amplitude, then you would need to uh, go do something like a black hole perturbation uh, theory, which um, is a way to obtain that Compton, that Compton amplitude. But that's difficult to do. Um, so um, one thing that uh, still needs to be done, and it has some nice prospects, is that uh, instead of having some amplitudes and then you bring this into your classical physics, is actually using classical physics to constrain how quantum amplitudes have to look. Um, which is what I was saying. If you want to say, what's my Compton amplitude that has to be that has to be right. Um, the information to, to do that, to fix that, uh, is contained there in the, in the classical problem, uh, solving something called the, the Tukolsky equation. Okay, um, long story short, there are many things that need to be computed, observables um, that have to be taken to a uh, three person Minkowskian or four person Minkowskian, um, and things that are very well understood, but there are also many things that are not that well understood. Um, we, we get closer in, in some places. Uh, we like uh, this, this spin story, um, but um, there is also cool physics to do in, in terms of um, what really means to extract the classical physics from some objects that really want to be quantum. Um, ah, uh, how on the double copy? Um, 
because the double copy is super powerful in other contexts in supergravity. It is in diapers in this um, in this context, but uh, we really think that we can harness uh, its power to give us uh, to make our life easy. Uh, because going to to hire post Minkowski and it, it gets it gets ugly. So um, even if it sounds like um, there is too little to do because it's only a linear impulse or radiation and spin effects. Um, there are really deep stories uh, related to each of them and uh, what are all the methods that you can apply. But uh, okay, let, let's leave it there. There is a lot to do, Andres. Yes. <laughs> In all of physics. Yeah. yeah. So we have Thank you. Well, the one short question or, or? Yes. We have anyone else? Well, um, well, if there is not, we thank Andres again. Thank you. I think that we might uh, stop now for 20, well, the next uh, um, chairman is here. So Brian is. <laughs>